So the final FRQ from the 2023 AP Calc AB exam is problem number six. And in this question, we have a curve defined by this equation. This equation is not solved for y. It's defined implicitly. Our comfort zone is to have an equation that's solved for y. You've definitely dealt with implicit differentiation, and, and this problem is definitely going to test your knowledge of it. So in part A, you're asked to show that the derivative of this implicitly defined equation, dy dx, is this. So if you use implicit differentiation, you're assuming y is a function of x. So for the left-hand side, when we do the derivative of it, we use a product rule. The derivative of 6x is 6 times the original second piece plus the original first piece. And then the derivative of y with respect to x is our first instance of dy dx. On the other side of the equation, the derivative of 2 is 0. And then I add on the derivative of y cubed. Now, if I'm assuming y is a function of x, I need to use a special chain rule to do the derivative of y cubed. So I'm multiplying by 3. I'm subtracting 1 from the exponent. I leave the inner function y in its spot. And then I multiply by the derivative of the inner function to finish that chain rule. Now I have to do a little bit of algebra to isolate dy dx. So I want any terms that contain a dy dx pushed to the same side of the equation. I've already got a term with dy dx here, so I just elected to subtract 6x dy dx from that. And then the terms without dy dx, you want them to be gathered on the other side, and that's already happening. The only term like that was 6y. I can then take dy dx out as a common factor, and then I can divide by this set of parentheses in order to isolate dy dx. Now, if you look at what we're trying to show dy dx is equal to, it's not this. We need a 2 as the coefficient of the y in the numerator, a 1 in front of the y squared, and a 2 as the coefficient of the x in the denominator. So I, I realized when I looked at this, I can factor 3 from the top, I can factor 3 from the bottom, and after I cancel those 3s, I've shown that dy dx is what they wanted me to show it was. Part B says find coordinates of a point on the curve where the line tangent to the curve is horizontal or explain why no such point exists. So you're going to have a horizontal tangent line when your derivative is equal to zero. So when is that derivative equal to zero? Well, this fraction can only ever equal zero when the numerator is zero and the denominator is not. So when is the numerator zero? That's going to happen when y is zero. Now there's a secondary question that needs to be answered here. Just saying that y equals zero is where you have a horizontal tangent is not enough because it says find not just the y but find the coordinates right the x and the y so we need to now know where on the curve does y equal zero well if we're on the curve that means we satisfy the original equation the equation that graphs the curve so if i put zero in place of the y's to answer this question in the original equation what i end up with is i end up with zero equals net equals two Obviously, that's not a true statement, and what that tells us is that there's not a point on the curve where y is equal to zero, and therefore this equation, the graph of it, doesn't have any horizontal tangent lines. Now, if I had gotten something like you know x equals 2 back from this, I would want to go back to what I had for my derivative and just confirm that I don't have 0 over 0. That's typically not something you run into in an AP exam question because that kind of takes a fairly lengthy problem already and adds another couple steps to it. Uh, but in this case, our conclusion, because we've answered this question, no points on the curve where y is equal to zero, no horizontal tangents. Next part of the question asks something similar. Determine the coordinates, right? So the x and the y of a point on the curve where the line tangent to the curve is vertical or explain why you can't find one of those. So the derivative is going to be undefined when the denominator of the derivative is equal to zero. Just like we did in part B, not only is the denominator of the derivative going to have to equal zero, but we're also going to have to satisfy the original equation. Now, the reason why I wrote both of those out up front in part C, I can't solve this equation for a numerical value. If I have one equation with two unknowns in it, I'm not going to be able to get a numerical solution for that equation. I need at least two equations with those two unknowns in order to be able to solve for numerical values. So I, I realized that I needed to create a little system here. This has to be true to make my slope of the tangent line undefined, tangent line vertical. This has to be true to ensure that my point is in fact on the graph of the 
uh, equation. So I'm going to solve this system, and I went ahead and used substitution. So I thought it's pretty simple to solve this first equation for x. So I just added the 2x divided by 2. x is equal to y squared over 2. I substituted that in place of this x right here. I uh, did a little bit of simplification, right? So 6 over 2 turns into a 3, and then y squared times y gives me a y cubed. Now these guys are like terms, so I can combine those. Subtracting the 1y cubed from the 3y cubed is going to give me 2y cubed. Dividing by 2 gives me y cubed equals 1. Cube root of 1 is 1. Substituting 1 right here, 1 squared over 2 gives me the corresponding x. That's the only combination of x and y that I get that makes both of these equations true. Therefore, my only vertical tangent is at 1 half for x, comma 1 for y. Last part of this is a little related rates question to finish it up. So they tell us the particles moving along the curve, and at the instant when the particle is at the point 1 half, comma negative 2, its horizontal position is increasing at a rate of dx dt equals 2 thirds units per second. So dx dt is 2 thirds at this particular time. We want to know the value of dy dt, the rate of change of the particle's vertical position at that same time. So I need to take the derivative of this equation again, but I don't want the derivative done with respect to x like we did back in part a. If I'm going to be using that dx dt value that they provide us with and generating a dy dt so I can determine it, I need to take the derivative of the original equation with respect to t. Both x and y are changing over time. That's indicated by the fact that this is the value of dx dt at this ordered pair, and then we're asked to find the value of dy dt. So we'd have to assume that both x and y are functions of t. So I'm using a product rule on the left. So the derivative of 6x would be 6 dx dt times the original second part plus the original first part, 6x, times the derivative of the second part. Derivative of 2 is 0. Next part, well, y is a function of t. y is changing over time. So I'm going to have to use another chain rule there, very similar to what we did back in part a, just a different derivative of the inner function. dy dt is how we finish the chain rule this time, rather than dy dx. I now want to substitute all my specific information. That's a 1 half for all of the x's, a negative 2 for all of the y's, 2 thirds for all of the dx dt's, I'm not putting anything in place of the dy dt's. I'm going to have to solve this equation for dy dt. And if you go ahead and do that, uh, what you end up with is a line that looks like what I have here. Now, you are going to have to isolate dy dt. So although it's not necessary to uh, simplify a numerical answer in the calculus FRQ section, because of the algebra that we want to do to wrap this up, I, I think it does make sense to try to you know, clean this up, clean that up, clean that up, right? It looks a lot nicer and, and a lot easier to solve for dy dt with this line. Uh, so if you do that, you can move these three dy dt's over to join the 12. So that'll give you nine dy dt's on the right. Dividing by nine gives you negative eight ninths for the value of dy dt at that ordered pair.